It's a pleasure to welcome Dominic Zumbul uh, from the University of Basel. Uh, he's uh, an experimentalist, a cryogenics expert. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he did his PhD in Stanford and, and Harvard in the early 2000s with Charlie Marcus, then went to Mark Kasten's group in MIT. Um, He's been looking at charge and spin inter and interaction effects in, in Gallimard's nine nanostructures and the fractional mm -hmm. quantum hall effect and so on. Then he moved back to, uh, to, to Basel, where he is now in 2006, and uh, very recently became director of the Swiss National Silicon Quantum Computing Initiative. Uh, so he's going to talk to us uh, about uh, that. And um, so he's well known to me as uh, for getting his electrons much colder than most of us can get them by doing very clever filtering to get down to five or 10 milli K. I'm sure that's useful for the quantum computing. Uh, so he's going to talk to us uh, about his uh, silicon uh, qubits. Uh, so over to you, Dominic. Uh, thanks very much, Chris, for the introduction. I hope you can hear me well. All right, so um, I would like to talk to you today about uh, our efforts to build uh, silicon and germanium silicon spin qubits. And uh, in particular, there is a two different systems that we're looking at. One of them is in the germanium silicon nanowires, uh, and these are running with whole spins uh, to make these qubits. And the other platform is the FIN uh, field effect transistor platform, which is also in silicon and also whole spin qubits. So I think by now, it's kind of uh, widely recognized that uh, building a quantum computer is one of the major challenges of our time. And obviously there are a number of different approaches to do so. There is a wide palette of different qubits. And, and this is an overview from Popkin from 2019 that just shows some of the most prevalent ones. And uh, there are uh, quite different platforms and they each have their own advantages and disadvantages. So for example, these uh, NV centers, they can even be operated at the room temperature, which is certainly an advantage, but it's maybe not so clear just how to scale them to a large number of qubits. And overall, I would say the size of the qubit is quite important and it's potential for actually integrating many of such qubits on a platform. So the overview I would say uh, that I would give is um, spins in semiconductors can be made very small. These are typically confined in nanostructures and they can be uh, very fast. So the gate times are measured in the hundreds of megahertz, if not more. Superconducting devices and trapped ions have of course attracted a lot of attention also in the media over the last few years. They're more advanced. They're already scaling to a kind of large number of qubits, uh, exceeding 100 soon and going even higher. But they're actually not so small, um, even though an ion is, of course, a very, very small object. The entire trap around it takes a lot of space. And it's, it actually takes, I would say, on the a scale of many microns, if not hundreds of microns, to trap an ion. And also the gate times are are quite slow. I mean, for the ions, even slower than for the superconducting contacts. There is also an effort to make topologically protected qubits in order to get much better coherence. And this is a, a big effort that's uh, mainly driven by Microsoft and their team. And these are Majorana qubits. And there is also very exciting physics that's going on in these systems and that people can study. But it's not so clear if these things exist uh, and, and beyond that, even what kind of uh, coherence properties they would have, or even the T1 has not been measured. So now going back to uh, the criteria from, from David De Vincenzo, which are now over 20 years old, there were these seven criteria that David De Vincenzo set up. A system has to be scalable. One has to be able to initialize, uh, do a universal set of quantum gates, gets to long decoherence times. Uh, one has to be able to uh, couple if distant qubits and to do the readout and so on. And pretty much all of this program we have been uh, able to do, but we still don't have a quantum computer. So there is a more updated view on actually 
uh, where you start from uh, once uh, the De Vincenzo criteria are actually fulfilled. And this is now taken from a paper from Michel Devore and Rob Sholkov from 2013. So once you have individual qubits, you need to actually start to, to have several of them. And uh, these layers go up to eventually forming a logical qubit. So this is built on the concept of error correction. Of course, quantum information is very fragile and uh, errors start to happen as uh, the algorithms are executed and, and many operations are done. And so many physical qubits together are grouped into logical qubits. And a logical qubit has not yet been demonstrated. There are some efforts in this direction, but the, but the error rates are not quite good enough yet to actually correct them away and make them live for a long time or indefinitely. This would definitely be one of the uh, milestones in the future. So there is a there is a big race to to build uh, qubits and make them better and and faster and. Uh, there is a number of different teams. So on the superconducting side, of course, Google and IBM are some of the leaders on, on that effort, and but many more have joined recently. I've already mentioned the Majorana effort by Microsoft. On the semiconductor uh, side, uh, Delft, together with Intel, they have teamed up to do silicon spins. Grenoble in France is uh, working together with Letty, which is also a, a semiconductor uh, uh, foundry that has a big clean room and they scale uh, silicon spins. And then of course, there's the efforts in Sydney uh, in, in silicon and also efforts in, in Tokyo that are going on. And now since about one and a half years, we've started a, a program in Switzerland uh, that's bringing together at the University of Basel uh, with the two ETH in Zurich and Lausanne, plus our uh, industrial partner IBM to also work on spins. And actually, it's a really exciting time right now. There's a lot of uh, spin-offs and startups that are, that are coming and appearing, and a lot of uh, uh, attention is being given to these systems. And their roadmaps now to scale to well over a thousand qubits. So now on the semiconductors. There is a, the by now quite well-known proposal by Daniel Laws and David DiVincenzo from 1998 to actually uh, build such qubits. And the idea here is just to have uh, spins in semiconductors to actually uh, form the basis of the qubit. <clears throat> and later they also proposed how to make kind of more complicated arrays with floating gates that are connecting individual spins and so on. So based on this idea, <clears throat> people have quickly moved from uh, kind of three, five materials that, that were uh, very easy to uh, manufacture and get very high quality samples with stable uh, uh, spins, uh, move away from these because of the nuclear spin bath that is prevalent in these. So uh, silicon has a low natural abundance and so does germanium only a five to 10% of nuclear spins. And also it can be purified to be nuclear spin free in, in principle. At the same time, there is this scaling of effort by the industry. I mentioned here uh, one of the latest uh, nodes that was uh, announced by IBM about a year ago, and they have announced what they call the two nanometer technology. And it's actually quite amazing. They can now integrate uh, more than 50 billion transistors on just an area of about 1.5 square centimeters. And these are operating at uh, gigahertz speeds and, and costs uh, hundreds of, of, of Swiss francs or euros per, per, uh, per chip. So the, the name that the industries are using, this two nanometer or five nanometer or whatever technology, it's a bit misleading. It doesn't mean that a transistor is actually only two nanometers in size. It just means somehow they call this technology that. So here there is a table that gives some overview uh, with this two nanometer technology that I showed this uh, big picture of. It actually means about uh, 333 million transistors are integrated per square uh, millimeter. So if you calculate this back, this corresponds to uh, a, a transistor size of about 40 nanometers, four zero. So it's getting small, but it's still not quite at the single digit nanometer level. Now, what it's interesting to note over the past decade or so, the so-called uh, FinFET transistors have been the workhorse of scaling. So this is a picture of, uh, of some of the earlier uh, devices that came out of this. 
And basically the idea is that you have gates, gates that sort of wrap around a fin, which is made or etched out of uh, silicon. And this uh, wrap around gates gives uh, better turn, uh, better on and off ratios. So you can basically control the electrostatics in these uh, systems better than before. It seems like the fins are actually finally nowadays coming to an end and they're going into kind of new technology to go to even smaller size. Yeah, let me skip over that. So this brings me now to our uh, initiative that we started in Switzerland a bit more than a year ago. So the idea here is to basically use uh, kind of uh, silicon or germanium materials to build uh, qubits, which are fast, uh, small, and, and potentially scalable. I mean, the idea is here, at least for, for some part of it, to rely on uh, basically build on these kind of 50 years of semiconductor industry developments to make uh, a potentially scalable qubits that use basically the kind of CMOS technology to, to make these transistors and to turn these transistors into qubits. And so uh, this is uh, an effort that's, uh, as I said before, uh, combines a few universities from Switzerland and also IBM research uh, and uh, yeah, so that's the effort here. We, we're working uh, on electron spin qubits, which need micromagnets for a spin manipulation, but also on whole spin qubits. In the whole spin qubits, I will focus more on in this presentation. There, the idea is uh, that the holes experience intrinsically a strong spin orbit coupling to, to the p-type nature of their orbitals. And this, this whole uh, spin, spin orbit coupling can be used for all electrical manipulation of the spins without the need of micromagnets. So the footprint can be made smaller here. All right, so let me start now uh, to present one of the actual qubits, which are germanium silicon nanowire whole spin qubits. And in particular here, if I just take a step back and show you the band structure diagram of such a semiconductor, then we have the conduction band shown in red here that hosts the electrons and the, the whole bands are a bit more complex because they're actually built out of the p-type states. We get here uh, the heavy holes and light holes, which in principle in bulk are degenerate, but if there is confinement, then this degeneracy can be lifted. There's also a split off band, which is typically out of the picture. So, so here again, for the holes, the idea is to uh, enjoy the spin orbit coupling to give uh, internal magnetic fields that can couple to the spins and create uh, spin manipulation. I should also point out that uh, there is another difference between the electrons and the holes, and that is the, the way they couple to the nuclear spins. So, um, the electrons have uh, S-type wave functions, and so uh, they have a highest amplitude, the highest probability to find the electron spin on, uh, on the site of the nucleus. So the contact hyperfine coupling there is present and can be strong. On the other hand, the holes have actually P-type wave functions, and so there is uh, uh, no contact hyperfine term. There's only the uh, L dot S terms that, that are still remaining from the orbital momentum. So, the, so the, the thinking is that generally, even if you uh, use uh, not purified silicon wafers, then the coupling to the nuclear spin could be relatively weak for uh, the P-type holes. So that promises to give longer coherence. Now, of course, the spin orbit coupling doesn't come for free. I mean, it can be used to manipulate these whole spins, but it, of course, also couples charge noise and, and can lead to decoherence effects of, of these spins. So that's something to keep in mind um, and to, to watch. So for these uh, nanowires, actually, these will be holes in a system that is uh, quasi one-dimensional Actually, for these germanium silicon nanowires, these dimensions, the transverse dimensions are extremely small. The shell is typically uh, of a thickness of two to three nanometers and the core is around 15 nanometers. So overall, the diameter with the shell is only about 20 nanometers. And, and this makes these uh, wires extremely highly confined <clears throat> and actually people uh, have, uh, theorists have predicted an extremely 
strong uh, uh, type of spin orbit coupling, which they refer to as direct Rashba, uh, which basically arises then from the heavy hole, light hole mixing that is induced in this kind of tightly confined geometry. And unlike the usual or more well-known Rashba effect, which is kind of a second order effect in the conduction band that needs to go through the valence band and back into the conduction band. Here, if, if we're looking at these holes directly in the valence band, it's actually a lowest order effect. And that's why this Rashba effect is actually much stronger, sometimes by two or three orders of magnitude compared to the more traditional Rashba effect in the conduction band. And uh, here, just like any Rashba effect, it has also uh, been predicted that it can be tuned, that it can be turned on or turned off with uh, electric fields that, that uh, can control this interaction in the nanowire. So the strong spin orbit coupling um, is, is, uh, pr has been predicted to lead to ultra fast qubits with gate operations in the gigahertz. Uh, uh, speed range, so kind of nanosecond uh, uh, gate times. So the, so the traditional Rashba effect, as I said, has to go through the bank gap to go through these excitations. So it's suppressed with uh, one over the bank gap. For, but for this direct Rashba, the relevant energy scale is now the confinement uh, uh, energy that we get in these wires. And that's of order of uh, 20 milli electron volts. So it's a lot smaller. Than, than the bank gap, which is suppressing it here. So, so with this uh, strong coupling, we can actually hope to get a kind of, I would say essentially a new type of qubit, uh, maybe a spin orbit qubit, where we control uh, due to this tunable uh, Rashba spin or orbit interaction, many of the key parameters of the qubit with gate voltage. For example, uh, it has been predicted that the G factor that gives you basically the energy of the qubit, the Zeeman splitting, uh, the energy difference between spin up and spin down, um, uh, that can be tuned with electrical fields. And also the strength of the spin orbit interaction that has this highly nonlinear uh, prediction here at, at low zero electric field, it's turned off and then it quickly turns on and reaches some kind of maximum strength before it decays again. So these are predictions from Kloeffel uh, and Laws from uh, 2013. So we can actually change the speed of the qubit by, um, I think I have that on the next slide. No, I don't. Um, so we can change the speed of the qubit and we can, we can switch it from a kind of fast manipulation mode when the spin orbit coupling is strong and turn off or make it much weaker and go into an idle mode. Also, this uh, electrically tunable G factor is extremely useful because it uh, could actually be used to couple, uh, to, to control the coupling of this qubit to a resonator. So if, if the G factor can be changed, then this uh, spin qubit could be brought on and off resonance with the frequency of a microwave resonator, such as a superconducting resonator. And this could be here simply controlled with, with an electrical field. So um, this is kind of true in principle in both these uh, germanium silicon nanowires and in the silicon finfets. I will now start with showing you some data from, from these uh, core shell nanowires. And we have a number of publications. So, so these earlier ones were the theoretical predictions. And more recently, we've also been able to realize uh, some of this in experiment. And I would like to thank the whole team uh, that's been working on these uh, experiments in the lab in Basel here, uh, but also on the theory side, we get a lot of very good support. And I should also acknowledge uh, Eric Buckers from the TU Eindhoven, um, who has grown the wires that we are still using. So here is a, a transmission electro microscope of one of these nanowires. This particular core is only about 10 nanometers in size and it shows a very good clean interface with the silicon shell, which then uh, leads to the situation that due to the band structure, we actually get a, a whole gas population inside the core for free. So we don't need to add any doping uh, we get already at, uh, without adding any additional voltages, we get the whole gas which is populated and we can then uh, basically 
by making uh, an arrangement of gates that are placed underneath the nanowire, which is contacted uh, on the right and the left side to, to drive an electrical current through it, we can basically use these gates as depletion gates to form uh, quantum dots or double quantum dots uh, for studying such systems. <clears throat> and with this, we can basically uh, form a double dot where we have on the left side uh, in the middle and on the right side barrier gates. We can tune the voltages to adjust how uh, transparent or how, uh, how dark these barriers are. And finally, we have in, the, in between these plunger gates that we can use to actually load holes uh, into this device. Onto one of these gates, uh, we've also connected the, the microwaves. It turns out here in this experiment, we had connected the microwaves on the leftmost gate. And this we can uh, apply uh, in pulses, so we can control how long we apply these microwaves. And on this plunger gate on the left side, we, have all, we also are applying a Coulomb pulse to kind of uh, uh, protect the holes during the manipulation uh, uh, from escaping to the reservoirs. So I, I don't show all the details here, but you can read up uh, the details in, in the APL that we had in 2018, as well as this Nature Nano paper from last year. And we basically bias uh, this double quantum dot into a Pauli spin blockade regime, such that uh, eventually the current is blocked because a triplet uh, state is here loaded. And only when we uh, manipulate the spin and we rotate one of these spins, presumably the left one because it's close to the microwaves, when we rotate this, then we can uh, convert this triplet, which is blocked uh, due to the Pauli spin blockade, we can convert this into a singlet and then this will produce a current. So if we do rotate this uh, left spin by um, 180 degrees, then, then the, it acquires a singlet component and we get current. And if you rotate it even further, then it goes back into a triplet. So in this way, we can actually perform uh, Rabi oscillations. And let me now show you the, the kind of uh, simple intuitive way how the spinning manipulation works. So when we're applying the microwaves here to the left gate here, then this has the effect of shaking the hole along the axis of the nanowire. And as it's doing this, because of this uh, potentially strong direct rush bus spin orbit interaction, as, as the hole is moving along the nanowire, this spin orbit interaction uh, creates a time dependent magnetic field, which is oscillating. As the hole is moving forward, it uh, creates a magnetic field perpendicular to the motion of the, of the hole uh, in one direction. And as it's moving back, it goes in the other direction. So this basically is a trick that we use here to, to create a time-dependent magnetic field without actually technically producing a magnetic field. This is all done with electrical fields. And when we do this, then we see here kind of a clear signature of uh, electron spin resonance, or we call it electric dipole spin resonance because we only apply electric dipole fields to do this spin resonance. And from this, we can of course extract the G factor and we can use this to manipulate the spins. So, so this allows us a coherent control of this, uh, of this uh, uh, hole spins in the nanowire. Now, when we investigate this, we look at how this uh, Rabi frequency that uh, results depends on the external magnetic field. We can also study how it depends on the applied microwaves. And in both cases, it's uh, more or less uh, linear. At least it's consistent with linear behavior. And so this is actually the kind of smoking gun evidence for this electric dipole spin resonance mechanism rather than uh, something else like uh, producing actual magnetic fields with, with the applied microwaves. But I would also like to point out here, when we drive this really hard, this Rabi frequencies here, when we go to the highest microwaves amplitudes, it actually exceeds here 400 megahertz. In fact, you see here one of these highest points, uh, we, we extract a fit of 436 megahertz, which is very fast. So this means the time it takes to flip a spin from up to down is actually of order of one nanosecond, just slightly longer than one nanosecond. So, okay, this data doesn't look very nice because we're driving the spins here quite hard with high powers, 
But uh, anyway, I think it's clear enough to, to see that this fast driving works. And once we do the kind of calibration of how strong uh, the electric fields are that reach the sample down in the refrigerator, we can extract uh, also the strength of the spin orbit coupling here that we see. And so this is corresponds to a spin orbit length of uh, four nanometers. This is an extremely short spring, spin orbit length, uh, uh, which I maybe can put a little bit in perspective uh, to compare it with some other values. So for example, in indium arsenide, which is also a material quite well known for its uh, uh, quite strong spin orbit coupling. There, it's about 100 nanometers. In indium antimonide, it's slightly shorter. So this is the length um, than 100 nanometers, maybe 50 nanometers. So, so this length tells you how far would a hole uh, or a spin need to travel to do uh, a coherent rotation of one radian. So the shorter this number is, the stronger this effect is. And this is uh, well in line also with the predictions that were made uh, almost 10 years ago by the theorists for this uh, germanium silicon core shell nanowires. Also as a comparison, later in the FinFET, the other type of qubit that I will also show a little bit of data of today, um, it takes us quite longer there to, to do a spin rotation and the spin orbit length is, is quite uh, almost a factor of 10 larger. Now, what we can also do is we can repeat some of these experiments and change here the voltage on this middle gate. And uh, this changes the local electric fields on these hole spins in the system. And as we're doing this, we can see uh, what the Larmor frequency, the resonance frequency of the qubit is. And from that calculate the G factor. And we find quite a strong dependence. So here, we're changing this middle gate from about 1390 millivolts to 1430 millivolts. Uh, no, note that these are positive voltages. So we have this whole gas in the wire and we apply a positive voltage to achieve a depletion uh, uh, of this nanowires and, and, and uh, locate only a few holes on each of these dots. We're actually not in the single hole regime. There's probably still 10 holes or so in each of the dots. But you can see here that this G factor is, is changing quite substantially by only changing the gate voltage by about 40 millivolt. This goes from about 0.8 all the way up to 1.3. So, so this is uh, about the 50% change of the G factor. Moreover, when we look at the Rabi oscillations over the same range of gate parameter space here on this middle gate, we can see that for the uh, uh, red data here, the Rabi oscillations are quite slow. So this is plotting the length of the microwave burst here on the horizontal axis. And this uh, femtoamps here, this is the leakage current. This is how strong we break uh, the Pauli spin blockade. And so here we can see how these spins are oscillating uh, around uh, the block sphere. And so you can see that the Rabi frequency is changing quite a lot. At the weakest points here, it's maybe around 30 or 25 uh, megahertz, and then it goes above uh, 200 here. So, so this is a, a change of the Rabi frequency by about the factor of seven. Now, ideally, uh, what would have been really nice here is um, if- Sorry, sorry Dominic. I, I just saw that we have a question here in the Q&A section. Would you like me to take this question now, or would you like to wait? Yes, on... sure. Questions are good. So, so there's a question. question. Yeah, let's, let's do that, make it a bit more dynamical. So the question is, are there any reasons that the silicon germanium core shell wires are chosen for your experiment rather than the germanium quantum wells? Yes, so the germanium quantum wells are also very interesting uh, systems. And there was a lot of progress that was made in these systems at, at some uh, places. Uh, but the spin orbit coupling that we can get and the control over it, which we can achieve, is by far, uh, uh, it's much better in this germanium silicon core shell nanowires. So, so the nanowires are a little bit harder to handle. I mean, right now we're placing them on the substrate. I didn't show these details, but we're placing them with a micro manipulator on the substrate. And so that's not very scalable, but uh, we're collaborating also uh, with uh, the group of Ilaria Zardo and also actually also Eric Bockers, the, the growers, they're trying to 
uh, grow these uh, nanowires also on the substrate so that we can basically pattern arbitrary networks of these nanowires in the future and then connect them together for kind of a, a network or an array of, of spin qubits in these. But anyway, the, the physics here in these germanium silicon nanowires is very interesting because of this exceptionally strong spin orbit coupling. The, the spin orbit coupling here is at, at least a factor of 10 stronger than in the germanium quantum wells. So I think that makes sense. Um, if there are any follow-up questions, please continue to put them into the Q&A button. And, and thanks, Dominic, for taking this question. I, I do need to apologize. I wasn't paying attention to the to the Q&A, but, but if you interrupt okay. me, that's perfect. Actually. Yeah, I, I'm supposed to be interrupting you. So, so you can just relax and, and, and go on with your talk. Thanks. No, thank you. Very good. So we were just looking at these coherence times. So we can just simply extract the damping of these Rabi oscillations and, and plot that also as we're changing this middle gate voltage. And unfortunately, it goes down by about the same factor as the Rabi frequency goes up. So, so ideally, uh, what would have been really nice if, if, if we would see more oscillations coherently when the Rabi frequency becomes faster, but this is not the case. What this means is that actually we're indeed tuning the strength of the spin orbit coupling. And so at here, these higher gate voltages, we're basically coupling in more of the, of the noise. And this is probably kind of, we don't know exactly what this noise is. Our guess is that this has to do with noise in the nanowire, the surface, the shells, maybe the oxide that's underneath the nanowire between the gates. Somewhere there we have, I think, a bit of homework to improve this, this noise environment still. But uh, in any case, what this demonstrates is that we can very well control our qubit and we can actually go to a, a gate voltage range where the Rabi frequency is slow and uh, we call that an idle state or we can change this gate voltage uh, just by 30, 40 millivolts and go to, an, a, to a control state where we have a, a fast uh, Rabi oscillation. And as I mentioned before, with this tunability of the G factor, we can also use this to uh, potentially tune um, uh, the qubit into resonance with a, a resonator, or actually also if we had some global EDSR driving field, we could turn this uh, on and couple it in this way. So, so that's uh, more or less what I wanted to show you. I mean, in the meantime, we have also managed to operate these uh, germanium silicon nanowire qubits up to four Kelvin at higher temperatures. There is a new manuscript where we also show this. The data that I've shown you here today was in a re dilution refrigerator at uh, 100 millikelvin. So we are currently working on improving these oxides and wires to get better coherence. Uh, and we're also uh, implementing a fast charge readout. The readout here was all averaging over seconds uh, through this Pauli spin blockade readout. That's not very efficient. So we're trying to uh, uh, do kind of a tank circuit uh, fast readout that's in progress. That's actually already working. And we're also trying to couple these uh, spins to resonators. I, I forgot to say this because the spin orbit coupling is so strong actually. This opens the door to a very strong spin photon coupling. So uh, basically uh, uh, this is quite unusual. I mean, normally you have to go through the charge and make a dipole and then the dipole couples to the resonator. But here, because the spin orbit coupling is that strong, we can couple the spins directly to the superconducting resonator. That's a prediction. We haven't shown this yet. So we're working on that in collaboration with the Walroff group at the ETH in Zurich and in collaboration with uh, the Schoenberg group also in Basel. We're looking to go to uh, devices with larger number of qubits, two qubit gates are something that we're also working on. And also we're working on tuning uh, these devices and optimizing uh, these qubits also with machine learning in collaboration with Natalia Ares uh, at Oxford. Actually this type of qubit which is highly tunable opens up a large parameter space, which is uh, which uh, is very promising for being uh, uh, possible to optimize well with machine learning techniques. So I guess I have another thirty minutes, or how much time do I have left? 
So you have about 30, 25, 30 minutes with questions, but it's really up to you how you how you use this time. If you prefer a long session at the end with, with questions, then you could cut it shorter. Or if you have more information, we're, I think we're more than happy to listen to that. Very good. I'll, I'll try to not go too long to leave a little bit time for questions. So I'm, I'm now coming to the second part of the talk where we where I present the uh, fin field effect transistor spin qubits. And I start here just with a picture um, uh, of the device. This is an SEM picture with a top view, kind of tilted uh, angle uh, view of the device. And we have here in the top right, the lead gate uh, and the bottom left as well. And then the purple uh, object here is the fin itself, which is actually etched out of silicon and is uh, fabricated along the 110 direction. And uh, so then we have a plunger gate that's sort of going over it. And we work hard with the e-beam lithography to make these kind of small so we can go down to about 15 nanometers of uh, gate length uh, currently. And if we look at the cross section across this, then this is the yellow box shown here. And you see that these uh, the fins are actually uh, quite uh, nicely kind of round shaped top. And we believe that the holes, the whole wave functions are kind of sitting at the apex uh, uh, of this fin at the, at the quite at the top. So when we do a cross section along the other direction, we actually developed this uh, self alignment uh, technique, which uh, after this first gate layer, that's the one that you already saw on the, saw on the other picture, we add uh, two gates in between the lead gates and this uh, uh, first gate, and these are self-aligned. So basically this, uh, we first grow the oxide around the, the first layer, and then we fill this. This is an ALD oxide. Uh, it's about 4.5 nanometers of silicon oxide. And then we uh, ALD grow this titanium nitrate gates, uh, G2 and G3, which are self-aligned. So, so this is kind of an elegant trick which is well known in industry. And we use it here to get quite small and perfectly aligned gates between filling the gaps between these lead gates and the center gate. And here, uh, maybe the most important oxide is the one that's directly on the silicon. The silicon is shown in purple here. And here we have a thermal oxide, which is also quite thin about, about uh, eight nanometers in, of thickness. So this uh, self-alignment technique, we've published it in APL uh, also last year. So um, let me go on to the next slide. So these devices are made in collaboration with our partner IBM Research in, in Zurich. And they have a kind of a state of the art, but a mixed use clean room. It's, 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 it's fully uh, equipped for silicon technology, but it's also an exploratory clean room that allows us to do kind of EVM lithography and fast and flexible processing compared to kind of wafer scale uh, uh, processing, which can take uh, several weeks, if not months, to actually complete. So, uh, right, and exactly. So now let me also show our team for the FinFET uh, experiments. So these uh, uh, measurements that we show here were also done in Basel, and actually all the data was measured in a variable temperature insert at, at 1.5 Kelvin up to about 5, 6 Kelvin, where the readout of the qubit stops working. And in particular, I'd like to acknowledge here uh, Andreas Kuhlmann, who is, is the subgroup leader on this project, and also Andreas Fuhrer, who is leading the IBM team uh, on that side. So we form uh, double dots in this, in this system. I should maybe have said that on the device picture here. So basically, we, we can... Now, this is also an undoped dev uh, device, but we have to basically induce the charges with the gates so we can induce a hole underneath this gate three, we can induce another hole underneath gate two, and that then forms a double dot with some tunneling to these leads on the left and right. And this gate one in the middle can control the tunnel barrier between them. And this leads to kind of nice uh, bias triangles. Here you see a sweep where we uh, uh, plot the, 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 the left and right plunger gates against each other. We get these bias triangles. Again, here we will also use a Pauli spin blockade to do the readout. So uh, when we 
don't apply a magnetic field, then one of these baselines is missing, as is the case for spin blockade. And when we apply some small magnetic field, it reappears, and this is the signature already of spin or recoupling. So here we're also using this. I just want to point out this is the same readout as, as for the germanium silicon nanolayer as before. What I wanted to point out here is that. Uh, this data, I mean, we've been taking data of this type for almost 20 years, but this is one of the first data that we get from silicon. And I, I was really impressed by the quality of these devices. If you also look at, at these data, um, I mean, for years we were trying to get whole data and only when we basically didn't dope the samples and only induce the charges with gates, we get such clean data of this type. So uh, now to go from a quantum dot to a qubit, again, we have to apply microwaves and pulses. And here in this first experiment, we apply these uh, on this plunger gate one uh, that's uh, closer to this, uh, what we call the red qubit or qubit one. And the scheme is exactly the same as before. We basically do the uh, readouts uh, part here at this uh, blue square on the baseline of one of these uh, uh, double dot triangles. And then for the manipulation, we pulse away the spins from the reservoir so that we can apply sizable microwave signals. And otherwise it works exactly the same. Now in this case, <clears throat> we actually clearly see two resonances. The uh, one that's, uh, well, we see two resonances here in, in this uh, spin resonance plot. And uh, well, we will analyze this a bit more. This is, as I said, at 1.5 Kelvin. And we can extract the two G factors uh, from this data. And uh, actually it's interesting as we're uh, changing the, the pulsing depth, we can also change the frequency of the qubit here a little bit, but uh, the spin orbit coupling is much weaker than it was in the germanium silicon. So here it's only a kind of percent effect, whereas before we could change the Larmor frequency by 50%. But what's very nice about this qubit is it not only gives still reasonably fast uh, Rabi oscillations, but also the coherence properties are extremely clean. So here we show uh, the, given the limitations of our readout, the, one of the longest uh, uh, pulse cycles that we can do up to two microseconds. And in this particular case, I think the, the qubit shows of order of 50 oscillations uh, that where we can't even see a real, really visible decay of the real damping of this uh, Rabi oscillation. So this, uh, this uh, higher current level, which is a pretty small current, it's actually only about 40 femtoamps, corresponds to a spin up and then the low current here, zero current, corresponds to spin down. And so uh, here the qubit quality factor is quite high. If we define this quality factor just as the product of the T2 Rabi time which uh, actually we cannot really reliably extract here. We can only put the bound uh, for this particular uh, case. Then we, we get the uh, Q factor here, it's just over a hundred. And um, of course we would like to go to longer pulses, but the longer we make the pulses, the fewer spins we cycle through and this will reduce the current even further. So we cannot go much longer than this. At this point, I wanna just mention briefly that uh, there's also a spin-off that came out of the group and it's, it's making uh, excellent uh, current preamplifiers. Some of these measurements that you saw now were measured uh, with, with these preamps and also voltage sources and so on. So again, here we check for the signatures, what's the origin of this uh, spin resonance. And again, it's linear in magnetic field and it's also linear in microwave amplitude. And so all of this is consistent with the spin orbit interaction, again, driving these uh, coherent oscillations. And the spin orbit energy that we can extract is about 50 microvolts. So this, uh, as I mentioned, corresponds to uh, spin orbit length, uh, since I mentioned this earlier, which is around 40 to 50 nanometers. Um, now, what's interesting, <clears throat> if we were to rotate the direction in which the fin is being defined, so right now these fins are going along the 110 direction, but if we rotate this in a different direction and put the, the nanowire or the fin and long along the 11, sorry, 001 direction, then the theorists are predicting uh, a 15 times stronger spin orbit coupling. And so, so this is a prediction and we are working on the fabrication to actually also make such uh, 
devices. Uh, the prediction then would be that uh, the spin orbit energy goes up by a factor of 15, but the Rabi frequency scales with the square root of this of this spin orbit energy. And so it would also give again spin orbit frequencies of order of uh, <clears throat> half a gigahertz. So, uh, right. Now we can look at the Ramsey fringes uh, in this particular experiment, and this looks also quite good. And this allows us to extract the uh, T2 star times in this system. And here we plot this, uh, first of all, for the two different qubits for uh, coded in red and blue, but also as a function of temperature. And we can actually keep seeing coherent oscillations up to quite high temperatures. So, so uh, here, the lower panel shows you uh, what this uh, damping looks like at uh, three Kelvin. And it still has quite a bit of coherence. Actually, here we cannot go higher uh, in temperature, not because we wouldn't be able to see any more oscillations. I think we would still be able to see them, but the readout will stop working at some point. So this Pauli spin blockade has uh, uh, failure mechanisms. Uh, one of them is exchange with the reservoir. And of course, if you heat up, then the reservoir broadening will become larger and you can start losing uh, basically your readout signal. So, so that's what's limiting. So operating these qubits at temperatures up to four Kelvin is actually quite uh, promising because, uh, well, when you start building not only one or two or just a few of these qubits, but many, then it would be very advantageous to also integrate the qubit control electronics uh, together with the qubits inside the refrigerator. And if you don't need to go to 100 millikelvin anymore, then the cooling power that you can uh, enjoy at four Kelvin is actually quite substantial. It makes it possible to actually in the future integrate kind of uh, CMOS uh, uh, control electronics, which is the same CMOS technology potentially that the qubits are made in. So, so this has already been demonstrated to some extent. Uh, Intel has this uh, horse rich uh, cryo controller, which was operating at uh, three Kelvin and it was based on uh, this uh, 22 nanometer FinFET technology. And this, this controller actually dissipated close to um, uh, 500, 380 milliwatts. So, so that's also possible uh, with, with our qubits. Now, we've also done uh, uh, Clifford uh, benchmarking here with Clifford gates. And uh, well, the X, Y gates are uh, both quite fast and uh, we can also do Z gates by tuning slightly off resonance. And we get here, uh, this is now the, the measurement at 1.5 Kelvin. We get here the fidelity for the single gate, uh, single qubit um, at the level of 98.9%. So, so I think the threshold for error correction would be at 99%. So we're basically at the, the threshold uh, of, of error correction for the single qubit gate. Of course, it's much more difficult to build two qubit uh, gates. These are more prone to errors. But anyway, this is a very nice first step. I mean, this is our first attempt at, at making a, a qubit uh, with this kind of FinFET transistor technology. I'd also like to point out that um, the coherence time of these holes is quite large and and given that the temperature where we measure these 400 to 500 nanoseconds is at 1.5 kelvin it's actually very very promising uh, also compared to many other systems we can do z gates at about 45 megahertz and we get these very high uh, quality factors so we actually get a very decent uh, uh, performance of our qubit here so here's a comparison to some of the other work that's being done uh, in the field around the world. And uh, basically on this plot, this is a little bit complex, but let me try to guide you through it. So the, the red uh, dots here are hot qubits. So uh, actually about a year and a half ago, the teams in, in Sydney and in Delft, they were also able to operate their qubits at around one, one Kelvin. And uh, these were uh, 28 uh, silicon moss uh, qubits uh, in both cases with, uh, with uh, micromagnets uh, in, in the case of Sydney and in the case of uh, uh, Delft here, they had these antennas. And uh, they also, uh, so what I'm plotting here is this uh, quality factor, this Q star. So this is the uh, T2 star from, from the Ramsey measurement 
divided by the time it takes to do a pi rotation for the Rabi oscillation. So, so here is this uh, comparison. And uh, yeah, so our FinFET, which is operating at 1.5 Kelvin here actually has a quality factor, which is around 30 or 40. And uh, it's, it's not, it, it's, it compares well to many of the other approaches. Of course, there is this uh, work uh, in, in the purified 28 silicon, uh, which uh, has been done at a number of locations, which gets even much better quality factors because the coherence there is extremely long. So, so that's still much better than these holes. But these were also done with electrons and these were done with, with holes. So yeah, that's also shown. The electrons have a kind of a blue hue around the box and the holes have these um, uh, red, uh, reddish orange shades around them. Another interesting thing to look at is the manipulation speed. So here now I plot the coherence time T2 star uh, ensemble average T2 uh, as a function of the manipulation speed. And we can now also add different uh, platforms. So first of all, uh, again, I show the hot qubits, uh, uh, which uh, I've mentioned before, and ours are much faster. So our our uh, set gate was the slowest one, and that was about 45 megahertz. The X and Y Robbies were uh, up to 150 megahertz, and and uh, that's quite fast. And then if we now add also uh, uh, many of the other uh, uh, qubits, then you see where we are located. So the germanium silicon nanowire is actually the fastest the spin qubit to date, as far as I know. Uh, there was another experiment in a hot wire from a Chinese group that reached slightly faster speeds. It's, it, it's, uh, it's uh, not now shown on the map, but I'm, I'm saying it. And uh, yeah, but the coherence here is not very good. As you can see, it's very low on coherence. So anyway, so this gives a bit of an overview of, of the various things which are going on. Okay, so I'm more or less at the end, and I guess I have then still a bit time left for questions. So, in summary, we I've shown you that we can make uh, a quite nice qubits in these finfets. We get uh, record coherence times uh, for holes in silicon, even compared to lower temperature. Uh, our high temperature uh, qubit is very coherent. We can operate up to five Kelvin and we can get uh, fast all electrical driving up to 150 megahertz. So um, in the future, we're working on doing two cubic gates. You already saw that we saw both resonances in there. And in fact, we have now demonstrated a controlled uh, rotation uh, uh, two qubit gate. That's also uh, working since a few weeks now in the laboratory. We're working on single shot readout, again, dispersive readout with resonators. Uh, tank circuits on a gate. We're trying to boost the spin orbit coupling and also go to arrays. And I guess with that, I'm at the end of my slides and I will be happy to take your questions. Thanks very much uh, for your attention and for the invitation. So thanks a lot, uh, Dominic. I can see that we already have, have one question from, from Hugo Lepage on the talk. And I should say to, to everyone else, if, if you have questions, please feel free to virtually raise your hand or write under the Q&A button or in the chat. But, but yeah, Hugo. Yeah, uh, thanks for this talk. This was a really, uh, a really nice, really interesting talk. Um, at the very beginning, you mentioned in your seven uh, Di Vincenzo criteria that the seventh one about communication or long range transport of qubits was not necessary for quantum computers or possibly not necessary for quantum computers. In this setup that you've described, how would you uh, allow for, let's say, long range even within one quantum computer between the processor and a registry, for example, how do you transport quantum information or how do you see that happening? Yes, so uh, there's a number of ideas which we are starting to explore. So um, <clears throat> one idea is to make the fin longer and put more gates over it. And that would basically allow to exchange couple just neighboring adjacent uh, spins to each other. And, and that would be a starting point but one could use uh, auxiliary technology such as uh, floating gates or also resonator coupling to then couple 
slightly more distant objects. Of course, exchange is extremely local and you have to basically make overlap of wave functions to, to, to do that. So that's not very versatile. Um, with floating gates, you basically create capacitance and you can, you can extend that to much larger distances than just overlap of wave functions. Um, what's also of great interest is then to couple some of these spins into resonators. So then you can basically place many of these spins since they're so small one can put imagine putting i don't know thousands or even more uh, potentially into a microwave resonator because the resonator is actually huge right so so the microwave wavelengths would be centimeters typically and and the width of these of these gaps in in the resonator is also quite large so that one could potentially accommodate uh, qubits in there so we're trying to now couple uh, individual uh, germanium silicon hole spins, but also the FinFET hole spins to some of these resonators, but that's uh, that's just beginning. I mean, there's many problems to be overcome. First of all, when you start putting lots of gates into and around these resonators, then you destroy the queue, you have to start put filtering in. So, so we started doing this, but it's this will take a bit more time for right. us to demonstrate something. But I think that's the kind of... Uh, arrays that we are thinking about to to kind of build up the the program ultimately i would say we i think we're still at the few qubit level also because we really want to optimize this much more so there's some very nice uh, theory predictions in particular stefano bosco has written a couple of papers with sweet spots so where you can have um uh, essentially a decoupling from, from the decoherence effect, yet still um, couple strongly to uh, the electric fields for, for manipulation. And this kind of sweet spot physics could really uh, improve the, the fidelity and the quality or the coherence of these qubits a lot. And we haven't even started investigating that. So I think once, uh, once we do that, then we understand the physics of these spins actually much better. And I think there is still a lot of unexplored physics. Actually, the theorists also predict that because of the spin orbit coupling, also the coupling to the nuclear spins can become extremely weak. There is also nuclear spin decoupling sweet, sweet spots, which we also haven't yet had a chance to explore. So there's a lot of interesting physics in, in these spins that we're just now beginning to look at. Yeah, Th this, is, this is quite cool, but I can see obviously the question everybody wants to answer with quantum computers is scalability. And so when you achieve these systems with a million qubits, uh, you have to pack them in a way and then having that many gates uh, can become unsustainable. So maybe you want to have uh, clusters of qubits and then you need to connect these. And so you need yes. some way of, of, uh, of having, whether it's long range or intermediate range uh, communication and then this, this method of, I guess, swapping nearest neighbors works to a certain extent, but I guess it's not the most scalable solution to uh, swap your data everywhere uh, all the time. But I, I, think, the, I think the wiring bottleneck is an important problem. You've mentioned it. I mean, at some point you just don't know anymore how to get all these wires to connect in, but basically, the, the solution there is the one that's already been uh, pioneered by industry many years ago. You basically make an array of, of gates and then you can, you have columns and rows and you can address basically individual, uh, uh, let's say sites or qubits by, by picking a row and picking a column and then you activate that particular qubit. So, so mm -hmm. things in that direction, not with particularly large arrays, but we're thinking about maybe three by three or four by four arrays. We're, we're having that, I mean, that's one of the goals for the next year or two to demonstrate devices in that direction. Mm -hmm. But the tricky thing there is a little bit that then then one row goes uh, over all the qubits on that row, right? And the other column goes over all the qubits on that column. And so the, the this, this kind of makes the requirements on the fabrication very, very high. Then you have to basically have them turn on at very controlled um, voltages. Otherwise it becomes a, a huge fine tuning problem. And, and I'm not sure how to address that. Maybe machine learning can help us there, but, but uh, yeah, we'll have to see how to do that. Maybe the fabrication 
can become good enough eventually to actually provide pr provide this level of quality. All right. Thank you. Thank you for this. Thanks, Hugo and Dominic. So uh, we have a question from Charles Smith, who, who asks, so uh, first of all, he says, thank you for a great talk. And then he asks, could you tell us more about the speed of your two qubit interaction? Um, yes. So uh, let me, I don't yet have slides. It's too fresh out of the laboratory, but I think I can still explain it to you a little bit, maybe just with this overview thing here. Um, so on this TEM image, you see that we have this gate one and this gate can actually tune the overlap. And so basically in, in the kind of uh, a level diagram, first of all, we have the, the, the tuning uh, of the double dot as a parameter and the exchange J will depend on this detuning. And we can actually, um, then as we detune very far, then the, the, exchange will get, the exchange will get smaller and smaller. But uh, uh, we actually, from where we started from this kind of data, as I've shown you here, the exchange between the left and the right spin was ex extremely weak. I think it was in the range of unmeasurably small or maybe kilohertz range. But what we can do is we can change this gate G1 to actually uh, make the overlap significantly bigger. And that's what we've done uh, after Christmas. And we've actually got them exchange couplings up to 200 megahertz. So, so that was uh, quite encouraging. And I think now we could do controlled rotation gates with kind of 50 nanosecond timescale. So um, uh, that was not quite as fast, but but uh, it's it's uh, also in the range of 10 to 20 megahertz. But we're still working on this, and basically the gate G1 gives us uh, essentially, I would say, exponential control over the exchange. But you also don't want to have too much exchange. You want to be able to turn it off when you when you don't want it. So so that's that's the kind of trade off that that we had to do. Okay, thanks to Charles for asking the question and thanks Dominic for, for the answer. We have uh, a further, so Charles writes in the chat, thanks, that sounds exciting. Uh, and, th and then we have a further question from Chong Chen uh, fr from Cambridge University who writes, thank you for answering my earlier question, um, which um, was the one to do with the silicon germanium wires um, that I asked during the, during the talk. Uh, so this this question is out of curiosity. How many wire wires devices have you been fabricating, testing to achieve the beautiful data that that you've showed? A lot, a lot. It's it's a struggle. I have to tell you, um, these wires grow uh, from the uh, self assembly process in three different directions. There's the good, the bad, and the ugly, so to speak. And uh, the good ones are the tiniest ones with the small diameter. This is one of the crystal directions. And then there is the kind of medium diameter and the kind of large diameter wires. And the mobility and overall the quality of, uh, is only good in the wires with the smallest diameter. So, so the task for the person who, who sits on this um, micro manipulator and picks which wire to, to slap down onto this pre-made gate pattern is basically to pick the invisible wire because all the other ones, the medium diameter is much easier visible than, than the other wires. So you have to look for the extremely faint wires. And by now the students have gotten really creative about how to you know, pick which wire to, to transfer and which ones for sure not to look at. And I mean, for a while we had a lot of the medium sized wires on the samples. And I mean, you, you test this, we don't, we don't look at them before measuring with the SEM because it damages the wires. I mean, we believe we don't, we don't have such good data on this but we don't want to risk looking at them. Um, and so we've had quite a few um, wires that we had to go through. Um, but yes, unfortunately, we're hoping to, we're working on improving this, this yield uh, quite a bit. I, I should have mentioned actually, just yesterday, 
this uh, this work on the FinFETs has appeared in Nature Electronics. And I, I haven't managed to add the citation, but it is now uh, available uh, on electronically. There's a DOI. Thanks. Um, okay. I have a question, uh, if that's okay. So I, unfortunately, I missed a bit of your talk, um, but I managed to come back just in time to hear you talking about the single qubit rotation using the spin orbit interaction. So you're oscillating a, a voltage on a gate um, to to manipulate to create a, an effective uh, microwave manipulation of the of the qubit. Is that correct? That's correct, absolutely. So my question then is really how local is that? Um, so does it affect nearby uh, qubits, and, and how do you how do you control that? Uh, yes. So it's actually a very interesting question, and we have been studying some of this uh, quite extensively. So it turns out there is actually two different mechanisms of, uh, of spin orbit coupling that can give you, or maybe even more, but I'm aware of two at least. And one of them we call iso Zeeman uh, mm -hmm. uh, mechanism. That's the mechanism where essentially you don't, you don't change, let's say, the shape of your wave function or the g-factor for that matter much. So you keep the g-factor constant, but you're moving the hole along the axis of the wire, which is, let's say, along the horizontal here uh, uh, on this slide. And the other mechanism is, is the qubit's more stationary. The, the spin stays more or less where it is, but uh, and this, this would be probably the case for the one that's more directly underneath the gate here, but you're actually massaging its wave function and you're changing the G factor a little bit. And in particular, you're changing the G factor. Well, G factor is a G tensor in these systems. And you have the components which are perpendicular of the G tensor to the applied, electro, applied magnetic field. And that gives you G, G tensor resonance. And we can actually distinguish the two things, and and the, the it's actually quite nice, and it can be ex intuitively explained. So, so the qubit that's directly underneath um, the gate, or more closely underneath, doesn't like to be shifted much because because there is not really a lateral force. So it will mostly have the G tensor resonance mechanism, and we can uh, identify that easily by looking at the dependence of the spin resonance properties on the external magnetic fields. We have a vector magnet. We can apply magnetic field in any direction of space. Uh, the field we need here with these G factors is maybe 200, 300 millitesla. So it's very easy to apply such fields in, in any direction of space. And, and then the way the Rabi frequency depends on direction and the way all these things depend, it agrees very well with the model. The qubit that's over here, let's say underneath gate three, when I'm shaking gate two, so first of all, it's a weaker effect because it's a little bit further away and it has a little bit of metal here in between, which also does a little bit of screening. But still, because it's electric field is coming from the side, it is much more effective at shifting it laterally. So, so the other qubit, the further away qubit from the gate to which the microwaves are applied is actually then doing this isoseman mechanism. And we can nicely distinguish the two. And, and when we apply later, we have uh, we've installed more microwave lines and now we can uh, basically apply it to the center gate or to the right gate. And we can swap things around to check this kind of hypothesis, which I've now give, been giving to you. And it works very well, it, it becomes exchanged. So, so for example, when we apply the microwaves on the center gate, then, then the isosamon mechanism is more strong for, for both of the qubits because it has kind of a lateral force on, on the holes. I don't so know if this answers your question, so, but... Yeah, I mean, uh, well, yes, in, in many ways it does. So, but, so it sounds, sounds to me like that you've got a, a kind of matrix problem to solve. If you're going to have many qubits, then you're going to have um, not, you know, next, next, nearest neighbor interactions to take into account, not only for the single qubit interaction, but also for the two qubit interaction. And I think that- it's, it's actually, I should have mentioned, it's not problematic because each of the qubits, uh, now if you're thinking, or if you're wondering about 
uh, basically starting to rotate qubits that you don't want to rotate because they're not like the one under your gate, uh, they're going to be off resonance. You see here, the two different qubits, they have two different resonance frequencies. So I have to really want to rotate this one or the other one by going to the right frequency. I can pick which one I turn. So you can make sure that if you said had a you know, 50 qubits or something like that, that any qubits with the same resonance were, were far enough apart that there would be no effect. So, no, I cannot guarantee with 50. I, I, I think we'd have to make that device first. But, but I mean, what I can say is that uh, there is also a decay with distance. So once you're beyond next nearest neighbor, I think the fields will be very weak anyway. And then given that there is a variation of G factors, I think it can be well controlled. Right. Okay, thanks very much. That was very interesting. A brilliant talk. Very, very nice work, obviously. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dominic. Uh, so, so Professor Ford, do, do, you, do you want to close with some, some final remark? I think it looks like we're, we're, we're finished with the question session. Yeah, I think we've uh, gone on slightly over time with all those interesting questions. So thanks very much, Dominic, for a very interesting talk and uh, for passing my student in his Viva this morning. So that uh, is two achievements today. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, so uh, and thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure. <laughs>